friends. It is great to be here with you this morning. Um, again, my name is Stephanie Ertis, and I am the Associate Director at Amcasa. I've been doing so I can get my certificate. I am the Associate Director at Amcasa. So I was with you last week for some of our presentations, and I'm excited to be with you for this last presentation. So today you have um, myself and Alyssa presenting for you, and we are going to talk about professional ethics, vicarious trauma, and self-care for advocates. So this is really like three mini presentations um, that we have kind of put together to end our session with. And I, I really love ending our sexual assault victim advocate training with this because this presentation today is really about you. This is um, up until now, we have really talked about how you'll be helping and serving sexual assault survivors as we should be for a foundational training like this. But this final web webinar in our sexual assault victim advocate training is focused on you and preparing and sustaining you for this work of advocating in this sexual to end sexual assault and to respond to sexual assault. Much like we did in our first webinar at the beginning of the month, or at the beginning of this training a couple of weeks ago, it might feel like a month ago if it does. I, I, I feel you. September's been been long. Um, so at the beginning of this, we did a session. We opened our session uh, with breathing and a grounding exercise just to focus us on the presentation and as an example of self-care. And we are going to do that again to start this presentation. Um, so just as a way for us to kind of wrap up bring our attention and our focus to this presentation and really thinking about what it's going to be like for us to do this work or if you've been doing this work for a while what it's going to be like for you to continue this work in the space of sexual assault um, prevention and response so i invite you to relax your gaze wherever you are um, unless you happen to be driving um you're welcome to close your eyes and we want to bring your attention to the inhales and exhales moving in and out of your body we're not forcing inner air out. We're just breathing and bringing that breath into balance so that your inhales are the same amount of time as your exhales. And you're relaxing into the rhythm of that breath and trying to let your thoughts go for just a few moments. We're gonna take one deep breath together to the count of four. So to begin, I invite everybody to exhale all the air in their lungs and then inhale, filling their lungs to the count of two, three, four. Pausing and holding our lungs with that air in it for just a moment and now releasing, exhaling, emptying our lungs to the count of two, three, four. And then pausing for just a moment, having our lungs fully empty, and then beginning those deep breaths again at your own pace and at your own count. So just taking a couple of deep breaths here, really trying to focus on that inhale and that exhale being even, the same length of time. And while we're taking some deep breaths, we want to take time again to acknowledge the survivors that are in our training and that we've shared this training with, and the survivors that we will help as advocates. We want to acknowledge the impact that this work and interpersonal violence has on us and all of us, our workplace, our community, our families. And with that, we want to commit always to gentle and honest conversations and dialogues when we're learning together. We always invite you to come back to this exercise in moments of stress or triggering or heightened emotions if it serves you. If you haven't already, allow your breathing to return to normal with just a gentle inhale and exhale. Enjoy a few moments here. This may be the only moments of quiet you get in your day, so I wanna give you that time.
When you're ready to come out of the exercise, maybe move your body a little bit, wiggling fingers and toes. If your eyes were closed, blinking them open, shrugging your shoulders, stretching your arms over your head, and then bringing your focus and attention back to us here at the training, and we'll begin. So we're going to start today talking about professional ethics. So our first of these three mini trainings begins with ethics. And we're going to define boundaries and ethics. What does this mean? And what does this mean in our work? We're going to explore those reasons and pur purposes that it specifically applies to advocacy work. And then we're going to apply the ethical compass to our advocacy work through a little exercise towards the end of the training. So like at the beginning of many of our trainings, um, we want this to be as interactive as we can make it. So lots of activity in the chat today. I'm going to ask a lot of chat questions. Um, Alyssa is going to help monitor that with me. And we really want you to participate at the level you feel comfortable. The content today is talking about you and some of your practices and some of the things that you do as it applies to ethics and vicarious trauma and self-care. So please share at your own um, at your own comfort level. Know that none of that is required, but we really, I think we can really learn from each other. We've been doing that when we talk about sexual assault survivors, but I think this is a way to kind of start um, learning from each other on how to sustain ourselves in this work. So I, I did direct service work for a really long time and ethics was always an interesting topic. And I will tell you, um, I put a lot of thought into this presentation when I first developed it because I wanted to have a really strong kind of conversation and content about ethics, but it's also a little bit hard to define. So I'd like to start out this part of the presentation with two quotes. So this first one says, the first step in the evolution of ethics is a sense of solidarity with other humans. So this quote connects ethics to other people. Like ethics has to do not just with you, but with you and others. And then the next quote talks about action indeed is the sole medium of expression of ethics. And so I love these together because this quote talks about ethics as action. So for our purposes, when we're talking about ethics and boundaries for advocates, we're really talking about the code, the rules and the guidelines that help us make decisions about appropriate actions we take with our clients. And so when you're thinking about ethics, I want to I want it to be very accessible language for us. A lot of times when people think about ethics, they think about like a really hard um, and writing intensive class in high school or college, or they think about a lot of like research or reading or books. And it's definitely all of those things, but we're going to make it really accessible in this training today and how it really applies to our work. So the first thing I want to talk about though is boundaries, because this is kind of the foundation of the work that we're doing. And we really need boundaries to help sustain us. And boundaries are limits we set up for our own protection and the protection of our clients. And I'm going to read that part again, our own protection and the protection of our clients. So boundaries aren't about just us and our organization. They're also about protecting clients and they help build a supportive healing environment. And so boundaries are the foundation for building that environment where survivors can heal and you can offer the support that they need. So I'm going to offer a pro tip here. And I did direct service work for 10 years in a, a couple of different settings. And in when talking about ethics and boundaries, this is really the best pro tip that I can give new folks. And for those of you that have done some of this work before, hopefully this resonates with you. We need to, as advocates, release our attachment to survivors' choices. If we start having opinions or hopes or really want them to take a certain action, we're really stepping over the, and really crossing the, the lines of boundaries. We're not in the role of they should do this, or I want them to do this, or this is what's best for them. That crosses a really important boundary. We've talked extensively in this training about empowering survivors and giving them the resources and support they need to make the decisions they see best for them. 
So to empower them, we need to dissolve our opinions about what is best for them and support them in the decisions that they are making. And if we aren't in a position to support them in those decisions because they are not and something that our agency supports. So maybe the decision to um, use drug and alcohol to, to cope. I understand where you wouldn't be able to support that as an advocate, but that also means that you're not making those decisions for them, that you're stepping away from something that and protecting yourself and using the boundaries um, that you set up for your self-protection. So think about that in your when you start to do this work, dissolving your attachment to a survivor's choices. And you may not voice those choices, but I still encourage you to examine and reflect if you are thinking those things, even if you haven't voiced them. Like, what role are you in the advocate? You're supporting, you're empowering, you're not wanting or wishing or um, deciding for them. So when we talk about boundaries, so this is going to be the first place I want you to put some in the chat. When it comes to boundaries, what do we create boundaries around? So think about maybe your agency's um policies or maybe some of your personal codes, what do you create boundaries around when you're working with um, survivors or clients, or maybe you're coming from a different industry? What were what were some policies that you had and what were they around? Like what kind of topics were they around? So I want you to drop these in the chat. I'm going to open up my chat box. Oh, boundaries around disclosing personal information, personal. And so that goes both ways. So, um, Paige said personal information. So confidentiality is absolutely something that there's a lot of rules around. Boundaries around personal life. And this is where a lot of folks folks are really seeing, you know, where we put up boundaries to protect ourselves. Boundaries around physical co contact, um, boundaries around doing things outside work hours. Um, I saw something in the chat scroll up about cell phones. So using, and cell phones could even go beyond um, to, that's a great one, but go beyond to using, um, you know, there's boundaries around how you communicate with folks. Um, we just had someone pop in money. Absolutely. Documents, disclosing other clients and their personal information. Absolutely. Oh, this is great. I knew that this group was going to be genius at this. Um, so I'm going to put up here some of the ones that um, I came up with. And I think you all got almost all of them. Um, so we talk about personal relationships, money, how we communicate, including social media, intimate relationships. So there's going to be boundaries around having intimate or personal relationships with clients that you're working with. Physical interaction is such an important um, area to put boundaries around because these folks have had their bodies violated. So things like, you know, if you are a hugger, and you're not going to bring that to work. You're not going to bring that to clients. Does that mean you're never going to, you know, hug a client? Possibly not. But there are boundaries around that. There are ways to approach that. There are things that we need to consider. Um, drugs and alcohol, which I kind of mentioned at the beginning, and confidentiality. So we create boundaries around these things because people can manipulate them to exert power and control over someone. So sexual assault is about power and control. We've talked about that since the beginning of this training. So when working with sexual assault survivors, we need to create boundaries around the things that can be used to exert power and control or even be perceived to create a power imbalance that could be a control imbalance. So this is we do not assume that advocates are going to um, exert power and control in a way that's inappropriate. We, we never assume that. We know that people are coming here with very good intentions, but we also wanna make sure we're creating that environment and we're building that rapport with the clients. So when they see these boundaries and these rules, they also understand that we have created a safe place for everyone and we're working on creating that safe place for everyone. So let's move to our next topic about ethics. So this is the definition of ethics. And don't worry, we're not going to use this one. This definition of ethics is a set of moral principles or a theory or system of moral values just does not feel complete to me. It is probably technically right, but it's also very circular. So it's like it's morals and morals are ethics. And I just I did not feel that this adequately helped us um, in our work as advocates. So I came up with this definition for us to use as ethics, a set of guidelines that helps us make decisions. And this is usually where ethics come in. It usually comes in where there's a gap in your policy and protocol. We cannot make rules, policy, and protocol around everything that we're going to encounter as sexual assault victim advocates. 
it would be way too hard. So ethics comes in to fill in some of those gaps and to inform our practices, our policies, our rules, our regulations, our guidelines. You know, it's it's kind of this this like glue that holds everything together and fills in the gaps. So when we talk about professional ethics, various jobs already have agreed upon ethics. And a great example of this is social work. This is a sample of the code of ethics that social workers use. And this is often taught to social workers from day one of their education. And many social workers can recite part or all of this by heart. When talking about the reasons for boundaries and ethics, this is to keep clients safe. You can start to look at some of these bullet points and be like, of course, this is to keep the practitioner, the, the um, social worker, and to keep the client safe. And this makes great sense because social workers deal with highly sensitive areas substance abuse, child welfare, sexual assault, mental health, it's important for them to have a strong and clear set of ethics and guidelines for their work because they work in such a realm where power and control has been abused. Other professions that have strong ethics are law, medicine, um, licensed practical count or licensed professional counselors. So if you are on LCP, like you know, that you are that you have ethics that you have to abide by. The Department of Defense and the Department of Justice also have powerful ethics. The Department of Defense has a whole ethical code for the folks that do work with their advocates that do work with the sexual assault survivors in the military. It's a, it's a very intense like set of guidelines that they want those folks to follow because of um, working with them in such a sensitive situation as sexual assault and military sexual assault and abuse. So this is a way to, to really help protect all of those involved. And these professions all work with people in vulnerable circumstances, the law, medicine, mental health, um, all of those things are really important to have ethics around. So that's why these professions, in addition to the organization they may work for, also have a set of professional ethics. And I love using the guidelines for social work because they actually talk about challenging social injustice, which may happen in the organization you work for. So when you are like, do am I loyal to the organization or am I oil, loyal to social work? You're loyal to these ethics that that you have that you have kind of ingrained into your profession. I love talking about the respect to respect the inherent dignity and worth of a person. What a great place to start with when working with folks that have been harmed by society, by oppression, by violence, um, by sexual assault. So these are not the ethics that you will be adopting as an advocate unless you are a social worker. But this is a great example of how ethics work in a professional setting. So I love, I love putting those up there. And great big shout out to those who are practicing social workers or have degrees in social work, because you've just been a great example for us um, that are also doing work in this realm. So I want to focus a little bit on um, some guidelines that you can use to make decisions when working with clients. So what are some advocate ethics? And this is really, I talked about building a toolbox of skills in our first session on day one, but this is also really kind of a toolbox of ethics. And you will build that with your agency's um, codes and protocols and practices and culture as well. But these are a couple of the kind of broad strokes that, that really apply a lot to advocate ethics. You are focusing on the survivor's wishes. That is the role of the advocate. And advocates are there for the victim. You may help the victim with a variety of issues. So you learned about the sexual assault response team and the different roles in that team, right? And they, you know, the folks really stick to those roles and it's really important that they know them well and they know how they apply to a survivor's experience. You may have more than one role with a survivor. You may be helping a survivor in a situation that involves legal advocacy. You may be helping them get access to medical resources far beyond a sexual assault um, response team re response where they, they have a sexual assault evidence collected. You may be helping them with that follow up. You may be helping them with housing issues or money issues like we talked about. So as an advocate, you are really helping them with a variety of things. So how does that play into your ethics and your role? 
Honesty is on here and really honesty really branches out. We want to have a foundation of honesty and transparency with survivors. And that's part of our ethics, but that really branch branches out to confidentiality and privileged information, which you all already talked about in the chat. So I feel very confident that this group that we've had with us for the last two weeks is just very focused on, you know, the survivor experience and understanding how the foundation of that is confidentiality and privilege of their information or pri privacy when it comes to their information. Staying within your realm and your responsibilities. So not practicing law or practicing counseling outside of what you're supposed to be doing, but really sitting firm and being grounded in that advocate role. And then respecting boundaries, your boundaries, their boundaries, the boundaries that your organization sets up. That's also a strong part of ethics. And I don't want to leave this section without talking about why ethics are important, especially if you are new to this work and you are just kind of dipping your toe into sexual assault prevention and response. I've been doing this work for honestly decades. I'm not, I'm, I'll be really transparent about this. And it's always been really important to me from like one of the first moments I found out about how deep this problem was. And it has really led me um, through my, my kind of journey and prevention and re response when it comes to sexual assault. So advocacy has its foundation in the grassroots of activism. And we don't go into the history of the movement in this training, but I encourage you to look for that information. Um, it's it's really, it really informs where we are today and where we are going in our advocacy work. But ethics, which is founded in this grassroots movement, it really gives legitimacy to our work. It safeguards the reputation of our work as advocates, and it protects the public from exploitation and abuse if we have these kind of ethics and this like code that we are following. And it furthers the competency and the responsibility and the practice of our role. And I will give you an example of this. So oftentimes people that we might encounter as we are helping a survivor that are not informed like we are, that are maybe not there to hear the voice of the survivor, will accuse, and I was accused of this as an advocate, advocates of making decisions for survivors, influencing them, trying to get them to do something that maybe they don't want to do. And that is way against our ethics. And so when I was accused of that, I was very easily able to say to my accusers, this is what I do. This is my ethics. This is what I do. This is what it looks like in action. This is what I do with every survivor. These are the options I give them. This is the discussion that we have around these topics. And it allowed me to do that without revealing confidentiality or privileged information to the people that were accusing me of this. I didn't have to talk about those specific conversations. I was really able to talk about what our work does and inform them about advocates and advocate ethic, advocate ethics in order to make that argument that I was empowering the survivor and I was there to support the survivor. I wasn't there to make decisions or give advice to them. So that's one of the reasons that we do this as we as we are as you are completing this program we really want to underline those ethics and why they're important and how to start building that ethical toolbox so we're going to end this section with an activity um that we call the ethical compass and what i will say is it is very hard to make like i said a couple of slides ago rules and guidelines and protocols around everything that you're going to encounter so instead of giving you a list of those things, we wanna provide you with this guideline to help you make ethical decisions. So this is what we call the ethical compass. And really the ethical compass is this, I'm gonna pop up what it is. It is a question that you ask yourself when you're about to make a decision with a client and you feel like you don't have a certain path. Your Does your action upset the balance of power or perceived to upset the balance of power between you and the survivor that you're working with. And this is the ethical compass that you can come back to over and over and over again, is asking yourself this question, does this action upset the balance of power? And so we're gonna, I'm gonna read you a little scenario and then I'm gonna ask you to answer something in the chat. So I want you to imagine that we are all out to dinner to celebrate my birthday. I've invited everyone, we're out to dinner. Um, and we are at my favorite restaurant and everyone's eating and drinking and having dessert. And you know the server from your role as an advocate. 
and they used your organization's services a little while ago, and you know how hard they worked to rebuild their life after their sexual assault. And you, you know, you are glad that they are, you know, back on, back on their feet, so to speak, so to speak. Um, you spend about $37 at dinner. What is an appropriate tip for this server? What would you tip them? You know them, you know, they've worked really hard. You know that they were financially impacted. What would be your tip on about a $37, um, a $37 um, bill? And you don't have to do the math. You can certainly, uh, Pamela already put in a percentage there. So I love it. Um, So go, I'm going to, while you're putting those in, I'm going to go back up to some of these comments that I wasn't looking at when I was presenting. Um, oh, I love what you put in here, Sandy. Thank you for commenting on that. She wrote, I normally do not touch, though I am a hugging person. But if a client hugs me out of gratitude, I receive and return the embrace. That's a great, that's, thank you for framing that for us, Sandy. That's a great way to think about that. Oh, Danielle, you're a social worker. Love the social workers. Oh, and Sandy's a registered nurse. They've got some, uh, my husband's a registered nurse. So they have some, they have some ethical code as well. Um, oh, Ben, thanks for sharing. Uh, in Ben's uh, parentheses, he has that he is a Navy victim advocate and he talks about the DOD scaffolding and how it's a solid scaffolding. So thanks for sharing that. Um, great. So answering our ethical question, I'm getting 18%, 20%. Um, 20% on the dots, like I would with anyone else. Um, I would tip them the same as anyone else doing a great job, um, within the same role. Um, excellent. These are great answers. So what I will tell you is all of these are correct. If someone had said 10 or 15% up to 20% is all correct. I also think even if you went over a little bit, so if you went, maybe you round it up. So if 20% was $7 and you put down eight or 850, you're probably fine. I always tip a little extra around the holidays and I always tip extra if I know someone's about to become a parent. So if the person serving me is obviously pregnant or if they've said something about, um, you know, expecting, I always give a dollar or two more. I also always give a dollar or two more to students. Like if I know, I used to work at a university. And so if I ate out in town and was served by someone I knew was a student or that I assumed was a student, I always gave them a little bit more if I could. And so I think even going a little bit over 20% would be good. But if you're, if you've got a $37 bill and you're laying down a $20 tip, that could very much be perceived as shifting in balance and this person possibly feeling indebted to you or your agency. And you don't want to do that. Even if you've got an extra 20 bucks and you're like, this is not a big deal for me, doesn't shift power and control to me. It's really important to see how it would be perceived by that other person. So sticking to what you would always tip, absolutely. A tiny bit extra, probably really still in that range of not... Um, spending that person or not uh, shifting the balance of control, but you want to make sure you're thinking about this from your perspective and their perspective, acknowledging that power differ differential and making sure that your action does not forecast abuse or ma manipulation or any kind of indebtedness to you. So you all answered that really, really well. So I want to end this very last slide talking about the hierarchy of decision-making so should you find yourself in a position where you are challenged with something, where you have to make a decision? I will say this stuff never feels like it happens between nine and five when someone's available to help you. It's when you're on a hotline at two in the morning, when you're in the hospital at 4 a.m., when you're trying to make a decision before anyone gets to work at seven in the morning, or you're working in the shelter, and you're really kind of struggling with um, what to do. The first place you go is your organization's policies. The next place you go is, can I ask a supervisor? Are they available? Is there a supervisor or colleague I can ask? And then the third place you can go, if none of those are available, is relying on this ethical compass. So the example that I gave, you're not going to be asking a supervisor about how much you give for a tip. You aren't going to, there's probably not a policy about that. So you're falling back on that ethical compass. What would, what would my actions, do my actions upset or upset the balance of power? Sorry, I stumbled over that last sentence. 
So those are some things to consider as we close out this section and you're making those ethical decisions. So with that, I am turning it over to Alyssa to talk to us about vicarious trauma. Thank you, Steph. So vicarious trauma. Next slide. So the learning objectives for this section. So you want to understand the terminology of vicarious trauma. We're going to talk about and comparing and contrasting vicarious trauma, compassion, fatigue, and burnout, and identifying warning signs of vicarious trauma and burnout. Next slide. So vicarious. So this is experiencing or taking on someone else's experiences through empathy. Trauma, as we've talked about, is a deeply distressing or disturbing event. And these two coupled together make vicarious trauma. So this is the emotional residue of exposure that those have from interacting with people as they're hearing stories of trauma and becoming witnesses to the pain, fear, and terror that trauma survivors have endured. So what are some examples, you can put this in the chat, of um, professionals who may experience vicarious trauma? Anyone who may have indirect exposure to trauma, so anyone who works with clients who have who have experienced trauma, any ideas on different professions? Yep, clinicians, definitely. Social workers, yep. Lawyers and interpreters, female lawyers and interpreters, doctors. Yeah, definitely. And on the next slide, um, we'll see a little bit more of this. So basically anyone who interacts with people experiencing trauma have, or have some knowledge of the traumatic event are at risk. So as we saw, so therapists, counselors, um, social workers, advocates, educators, healthcare professionals, law enforcement, legal services staff, caretakers, and pretty much anybody with direct, indirect exposure. So that's kind of like a catch all because it's impossible to list everyone. Um, so next slide. So vicarious trauma. So this is essentially like the cost of caring as some people may call it. So some signs that you may be experiencing vicarious trauma is physical and psychological symptoms often associated with the trauma. So this is also known as secondary traumatic stress. Um, there's emotional attachment to a survivor's decisions over identifying with a survivor's story, difficulty in maintaining professional boundaries, and overly preoccupied with thoughts of a survivor outside of the workplace. So those are some of the symptoms of vicarious trauma. Another cost of caring um, that I wanted to real quick highlight um, is something called countertransference. And, um, if we could just put in the chat like a yes or no, has anyone heard of countertransference? Or if they know what that is? Okay. So I'm seeing some yeses, um, but I also saw a no. So I just wanna go over it real quick to make sure we're all on the same page. So countertransference is basically when the helping professionals, so like nurse, um, law enforcement, victim advocate, social worker, um, so when they are unconsciously projecting their feelings about a client situation back onto the client or survivor. So like, for example, like, what does this mean? So this would be like, say the client or survivor is describing um, like a traumatic experience that they had. And maybe the advocate experienced something in their past that is similar to what the client is describing. Or maybe they know a friend or relative who experienced something um, that's similar to what the client is describing. So now the client has these emotions that are stirred up in them about what the client is describing, and they're projecting those thoughts or feelings onto the survivor. Um, and so this is dangerous because as we've talked about, we don't want to be projecting stuff onto the um, survivor um, or crossing those boundaries. Um, and so, one way to combat this in the moment is thinking about before you ask a question or like, why, why do you need to know this information or why are you saying these things to the survivor? Um, like, do you really need to know that or do you really need to say that? And so taking a, a moment to just think about it before you say it um, and maintaining those boundaries with the client um, or survivor. Another thing that you can do is once you're not with the survivor anymore, talk with a uh, supervisor or with a colleague or do some additional reflection and think about like, why were these feelings stirred up in me? Um, next slide. So according to a study that was published in 2019 um, from the Journal of Social Work on predictors of secondary traumatic stress among social workers, 80% of survey respondents reported meeting diagnostic criteria for at least one of three secondary traumatic stress 
symptom clusters on a scale. So I just want to go into a little background on like what these symptom clusters are um, in the scale, just so we can get into these statistics. So the first symptom cluster um, for secondary traumatic stress is intrusion symptoms. So these symptoms can include intrusion, intrus intrusive thoughts about clients, um, disturbing dreams about clients, um, reliving a client's trauma, psychological distress. Um, the second cluster is avoidance symptoms. So this is like avoidance of people, places, things, inability to recall client information, diminished, diminished activity level, detachment from others, emotional numbing. Um, and then the, fin the final cluster is arousal symptoms. So this is um, difficulty sleeping, irritability, difficulty concentrating, hypervigilance. Um, so now going back to the study, now that we have the background information. So 31% um, of the survey respondents, respondents said that they experienced secondary traumatic stress because of working with a client population that had experienced um, trauma. So of those who work directly with traumatized clients, 40.35% reported having trouble sleeping as a result of their work. 39.47% reported having trouble concentrating. 37.72% reported wanting to avoid working with some clients. And 35.96% felt emotionally numb. And 15.79% reported reliving the traumatic experiences that were experienced by their clients. So that's that vicarious trauma at work. Next slide. So some people who experience vicarious trauma may also experience compassion fatigue. So compassion fatigue is empathetic strain and general exhaustion resulting from caring for people in distress. So some symptoms of compassion fatigue, this would be that emotional detachment and numbing, social withdrawal, intrusive or negative thoughts, um, or secretive self-medication. Next slide. So long-term consequences if vicarious trauma is not addressed. So this would be your vicarious trauma that we've talked about, and then this prolonged stress, and together that can create burnout. Next slide. So burnout is a state of emotional, physical, and mental exhaustion caused by excessive and prolonged stress. It occurs when you feel overwhelmed, emotionally drained, and unable to meet constant demands. So some signs that you may be experiencing burnout. So you got poor attitude towards coworkers or agency or the clients losing your why. So this is like your purpose. Um, I remember someone put in the chat at the very beginning of this webinar series about, you know, we're, we, a lot of us are here because, you know, we're driven to help people. Like we are called to serve. And so this, so burnout can affect that and make you question like, why am I even doing this? Why am I here? Um, you also have continued exhaustion um, and decreased performance um, and productivity. Um, and so really the ultimate cure for burnout is going to be self-care. So this is taking time away from work. Um, this is doing your self-care activities, which we'll get into more um, in this presentation. Next slide. So trauma-informed workplaces, every person we encounter has likely experienced direct or indirect exposure to trauma within their lifetime. Trauma-informed practice should not end with how clients are served. Professionals in the victim services field can also benefit from a trauma-informed practice within their work. Agencies should prioritize policies to help prevent and address vicarious trauma and burnout in the workplace. I also want to add um, that while I was preparing for this presentation, I found a really great resource um, that I can put in the chat later. It's from the University at Buffalo School of Social Work, and they have really helpful uh, self-assessments for helping professionals like advocates. Um, and it's on burnout, secondary traumatic stress, um, and compassion fatigue. But you can you can take these assessments and kind of gauge like where are you with these things? Like how much, uh, like where, like how are you like feeling with those things, whether you're really at risk, um, and kind of thinking about in the future, like how you might want to prevent these things. So I can drop that into the chat later. I just thought it was really helpful and I wanted to make that note before I forgot. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, so going back to the trauma-informed workplace, so you want to make sure that if your wor workplace is not currently using trauma-informed practice, um, advocate for this, um, address vicarious and trauma burnout by making sure that your workplace has these things. Next slide. I'm going to hand it back over to Steph. All right, friends. All right. Thank you, um, Alyssa. So we did not want to leave this presentation with vicarious trauma and burnout. We want to talk about self-care and what that means and have a, a kind of a deep conversation about what that means for advocates. Um, so we are going to talk about in our presentation, 
in this last little mini pre presentation, we're going to talk about what is self-care. We're going to actually define it. We're going to analyze why we don't practice self-care. And then we're going to describe the consequences of poor self-care. Um, we're going to classify and evaluate self-care strategies. And we're going to create a personal self-care plan. And that last part about creating a personal self-care plan is what we're going to leave you with. You're going to get to some tips on doing that and some tools on doing that for yourself. So what is self-care? This is something that you have probably heard this word a lot in the last couple of years. And I feel like the, the definition of it may have been a little bit warped. So let's go back and have a shared definition of self-care. So these are intentional activities and practices meant to reduce stress and maintain it. physical, psychological, spiritual, emotional, financial health, and, and how, how you define that. So we're going to talk about all of those areas. But in order to do that, I also think we need to talk about self-care versus self-soothing. So you often hear the term self-soothing, I'm going to stumble a little bit there, self-soothing as part of infant or child development. So You'll hear people talk about babies sleeping through the night or waking up and not crying out and them developing self-soothing skills. We carry self-soothing techniques with us throughout our lives and they grow and they change as we grow and change. So self-soothing techniques are typically things we really like to do. So they may be things like going for a run, yoga, um, talking on the phone to our friends, binge watching TV and scrolling or posting on social media, deep breathing, drinking a beer or a glass of wine after a stressful day, eating a piece of dark chocolate. And I'll be totally transparent here. For me, I can eat a piece of any chocolate and it feels self-soothing. Um, I have a real sweet tooth. And I'll give you an example. This happened last night. So my husband was making dinner and he was like, I'm thinking of opening this VNA, this bottle of white wine. Um, do you want a glass? And normally on a Wednesday night, randomly, I would not, that would not be something I'd want to do. But September has been a really busy month at MCASA. So I was like, yes, absolutely. So we had dinner. We both had a glass of wine on our back porch. Felt very self-soothing, felt very stress relieving. But if we were opening a bottle of wine every single night because we were so stressed out, and we weren't getting along unless we were drinking this bottle of wine, that is where self-soothing kind of crosses the line and is no longer self-care. So we're going to get into that a little bit. Um, so even though self-soothing is absolutely part of self-care, it helps to it can help to manage stress. It can help to make us happier and more relaxed in the moment. But self-care really goes beyond making ourselves feel better. And it's really about taking care of ourselves and building our own resilience. An example from my own life, in addition to the one I gave you about drinking some white wine last night, is that I do yoga on a regular basis. Um, I have been for years. I find it both self-soothing. It's also self-care for me. For like the long term, it's helping to improve my health. I also have to make a doctor's appointment this month with my dermatologist. That's absolutely self-care to do those yearly checkups, to see your dentist, to see your dermatologist, to, you know, get regular tests done if that's needed. But I wouldn't call any of that work, getting uh, any of those doctor's appointments or medical appointments, self-soothing. But they do help me maintain my resilience and maintain my ability and sustain my ability to be able to do this work as it keeps my health up. So like I said, some self-soothing techniques can go against our strategies to take care of ourselves. So I gave the example of drinking a bottle of wine every night. Um, I also love the example of baking delicious treats and eating them. I love to bake. I love sweet things. But if I bake every time I'm stressed out and I eat all of the things I've baked, that really could go against my long-term health. And those sugary treats could really start to impact my long-term self-care. So no judgment if you also have a sweet tooth, um, but that isn't always self-care. You know, indulging in the cookies and um, the chocolate every once in a while, absolutely. But we want to keep that self-soothing to a point where it's helpful for us and not working against that long-term self-care. So this next slide talks a little bit about why we don't practice self-care. 
So go ahead and put this in the chat if you're comfortable. And I'm going to get on my soapbox here a little bit about self-care, hopefully inspiring you to do more of it. And then we're going to talk about why we don't do it. So Audre Lorde has this great quote about self-care where she talks about caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It's self-preservation. And that is an act of political warfare. And I love this second part. So I'm sure you've heard things like you can't pour from an empty cup. You can't serve from an empty dish. Taking care of yourselves helps you take care of others. All of that is true. What I love about what Ms. Lord says is your self-preservation in this work is an act of political warfare. Her work is hard. Um, not everybody in the world is supportive of it. They don't want the change for ending sexual assault that we do. And the funding is always, um, we're always fighting for funding. We're always fighting for um, more and more and more accessible services for our survivors. And this can be exhausting. So if we want to continue this work, if we want to end sexual assault, we need to take care of ourselves and we need to take care of each other in this work. And that is our act of political warfare because as much as there are folks out there that want to keep us down, and these aren't specific folks, this is just the society that we built around. I don't think there is like an evil villain somewhere wanting to keep sexual assault alive, right? Like, like uh, you know, wringing their hands. Like, I, I don't believe that, but I do believe that the system is hard to work in. And if we want to fight that system, that that system of oppression, that system that um, keeps sexual assault um, around, so to speak, we, we need to take care of ourselves and we need to take care of each other. So that's kind of my soapbox on taking care of ourselves. It's way beyond just helping ourselves feel good. It's helping us end sexual assault and it's helping us to respond to sexual assault in ways that are really going to um, work towards improving the response for survivors. So taking care of ourselves is part of that. So um, we have some folks talking about, I love this one answer. It's just like adulting gets in the way of practicing self-care. That is probably, I could probably just stop right there. Absolutely. Um, we also have some folks talking about focusing on work, loss of balance in life, feeling like um, you're the only one um, that can do a good job. Absolutely. All of those things. Um, it can be hard to leave work at home, especially if you're working from home. And CASA staff works a lot from home. I know some other counselors, mental health workers, advocates are also working from home. Really hard to leave your work at home. Really hard to leave it at home if you are working in your home. Absolutely. So how do you set up those practices to help do that? Um, you're busy caring for other people. Um, things just get in the way of our self-care or what we perceive self-care to be. So some of these you put up there, but some of the other ones too, we feel selfish about it. Um, we don't have enough money or we're too busy to do self-care. One of the things that I am most frustrated about with the self-care talk in the last couple of years is it's really become a marketing ploy. Like self-care can be very expensive. If you want to spend a day at a spa doing self-care, more power to you. But that is that is out of the price range of some people, including myself. Um, I can't, you know, I'm not going to be able to do that. Um, but that doesn't mean that's my only option for self-care. There's lots of self-care that costs nothing or almost nothing. But we don't see that in the world a lot. We see the self-care that costs money. We see the beach vacation. We see... Um, the activities that cost money to buy that equipment, like like I love to golf, but golf is very expensive. So if that's your self-care, and that can be really tough on your budget. We see the things like the spa packages. Um, that's great self-care, but there's also a lot of self-care that does not cost money. And we're going to talk about some of that. And I'm hoping you can give us some of your tips as well. So, but self-care, there are consequences to not practicing good self-care. And I want to talk about those before we actually talk about what we do for self-care. So we pay a price in our minds, in our bodies, in our hearts when we don't practice good self-care, or we let our self-care and our self-soothing get out of balance. And for many of us, we know when we're not practicing good self-care. And so we're going to have a little confession time here. And I want you to put in the chat, only if you're comfortable, how you know you're not practicing good self-care. What are the indications? What are the things that stop you in your tracks? And you're like, I'm I'm not, I'm not really taking care of myself. And, and if I start to do some things to take care of myself, this might change. Um, so while you're doing that, I will tell you some of the things that happen to me when I'm not practicing self-care. So I have an eye twitch. 
and it is distracting and it is annoying and I cannot physically control it. So I know if I'm stressed out, if I'm not practicing good care, if I'm staring at screens too long, my eye will, it's mostly my right eye, sometimes it's both of them, will twitch out of control and it will last a pretty long amount of time. Closing my eye doesn't help. Water drops doesn't help. What helps is me practicing that self-care and preventing it before I even get there. The other thing I do is I clench my teeth and wear a retainer at night. I'm not ashamed. I'm thankful that I have the ability to wear a retainer at night. Um, I started wearing it about a year ago. My orthodontist said it would last the rest of my life. I chewed through it in a, in 12 months, like almost a year. So I have to get a new one made. And my orthodontist, I just saw him last week was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I've, I've never seen this. I don't know what to do with this. He's like, we need to get you a new one. And I was like embarrassed, right? Cause I was like, I can't control the clenching, but I know if I'm clenching my teeth, that's how hard I clench them. So I know the more stressed I am, the less I'm taking care of myself, the more I'm having that nighttime clenching. And some of you might be clenchers or grinders too. And I like, if you grind your teeth as well, I sympathize with you because it very, feels very out of control. Um, you're sleeping, you can't control it. But that's when I really know I need to take a step back, take some time off, really focus on some self-care. Um, so those are a couple of mine. I see a lot of responses in the chat. So let me go through some of these. Headaches, 100%. Getting angry easier. One time I was so stressed out, I got angry at my bowl of oatmeal for overflowing in the microwave. And oatmeal is indifferent. It does not, it should not have made me that angry, but I very much understand that. Um, somebody else also has uh, teeth clenching, insomnia, not eating or not eating healthy. Maybe you're grabbing a lot of snacks or doing a lot of fast food, or you're just not hungry and not eating and not nourishing your body. Absolutely. Um, someone else is a twitcher. I I get it. It's 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 so annoying, and it just feels like my body is really angry at me and really giving me those signs. Feeling tired all the time, 100%. Not having social energy left for the fun stuff. Um, getting out of balance in your cycle with work, sleep, you know, just feeling like you're in this constant grind. Um, wanting to or feeling isolated. Oh, these are great. Thank you all for sharing these. Um, uh, someone also is talking in the chat about where they feel stress in their body. And I love when people share that. Because one of the things I, I noticed a lot as an advocate is you could really see the stress of sexual assault in survivors. They, they could feel it in their body. All of these things were also happening to them. So it, when we are able to relate to that, um, I think that's really helpful. You know, I remember saying to several survivors, like, is there any place you feel safe walking? Like, can you move any of this stress in your body in a way that you could feel more comfortable. So this relates directly back to how we all suffer the consequences of poor self-care. Now for survivors, they're, what's what the stress they're feeling in their body isn't about poor self-care, but it's important for us to take care of ourselves so that we aren't experiencing these things. All of these things make our work harder and keeping our self-care in a good balance can help us can help us fight those things. So thank you so much for sharing um, your confessions too and how and how you know when your body is really needing self-care and your heart and your soul are really needing that extra time. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this on this because we've we already talked about this, but these are some ways that you can start to really see the consequences of poor self-care and those consequences. And I don't even like to say poor self-care. What I would like to say is going back to what Alyssa said. These are the consequences of burnout, vicarious trauma, passion can fatigue. So you have areas of your personal life, your workplace, and your health that really start to get affected. So, you know, it starts to affect relationships. It starts to affect your physical body, fatigue, getting sick, weakened immune system really can start to affect your workplace. So low morale, not being able to get up in the morning or feel motivated to go to work, um, absenteeism, lateness, um, having, um, some challenges with your coworkers and those relationships being strained. These are so poor self-care. And I don't even like, I want to stop saying that. I want to go back to experiencing vicarious trauma and burnout can really impact all of these areas and really start to um, 
really start to affect our ability to do our work, our ability to enjoy our life. And so we do this part of the presentation because we want to make sure from the beginning, or if you've already done advocacy work, you can have a good check-in on how important self-care is and what we can do to help with self-care. So I want you to, I'm going to put in actually, um, we are going to talk about some of your self-care and your self-soothing techniques. We are going to break down what we call the self-care wheel. So you don't have to put this in the chat now, but start thinking about some things you might be comfortable sharing. And I really encourage you um, to share if you feel comfortable. And I do that because self-care has also gotten this reputation of a person sitting in the woods, meditating, or someone doing yoga or someone in a hot bath, or someone drinking tea, and all of those things, honestly, that's like basically my self-care routine. So I get it. But I also think there's so much more out there when it comes to self-care and self-soothing that we're not talking about. And so I think it's great to share so that we can learn from each other. And someone can be like, you know, drinking tea in a hot bath, I hate that. That does not work for me. I do not like to be hot. But I really like this thing that someone else brought up about taking dance classes or about fishing or about, you know, reading, um, you know, reading like a certain kind of book that they like to read. So, or listening to audiobooks. Like, so I encourage you to, as you feel comfortable, list some of those things so we can learn from each other. So before we get into that, I do want to talk about some self-care strategies. Can you So I want to talk about some self-care strategies. So I want to talk about the, the three R's and this is real. Oh, this is going, I'm going to actually have, I think I stepped over Alyssa. So actually I'm going to have Alyssa talk about this. Um, last time Thank I did you. this presentation, I did it by myself. So I'm going to turn this good. over these next few slides over to Alyssa. Thank you, Steph. Um, so the three R approach. So first up we have recognition. So you want to watch for the warning signs. Um, this is, again, thinking about vicarious trauma, compassion, fatigue, burnout, warning signs. Then we have reversal. So this is undoing the damage by managing stress and seeking support. So this will be when we get into thinking about um, our self-care strategies and activities that we're doing. Um, and then resilience. So build your resilience to stress by taking care of your physical and emotional health. Next slide. So self-care action plans. So the first step of the action plan is to identify the problem. So the thing that is contributing to your burnout or is manifesting as your burnout. One thing I want to note is problem identification doesn't just have to happen after you've already started to experience these symptoms. It can also be preventative. Um, so when you're thinking about the next step here with a goal, I like to think of this as like a broad vision for yourself that you have about how you're going to address the problem. So if it's um, to increase self-protective factors um, by you know, increasing self-care um, to prevent burnout, or if it's to reduce burnout or to reduce um, compassion fatigue, like that's like your broad vision for what you want to address. That's your goal. Then you have your strategies. So that's like still a little broad, but a little bit more specific than your goal. Um, so this could be something like increase physical wellness or increase spiritual wellness or something like that. Um, and then you have techniques and that's like the most specific you can possibly get that's going to go under your strategies. So say your strategy was to increase physical wellness. Maybe your technique or activity is um, go for a walk for half a mile each day or something like that. Um, so as you move through your self-care action plan, you want to be like thinking about like what is something that is achievable for you. The last thing we want to do is create some lofty goal that you can't actually meet because that will just create more stress. Um, so you want to be thinking about like how can we make this specific and also how can we like make it measurable because we also want to reevaluate this. Like maybe you do your self-care action plan for like a week or a month and then think about like, okay, am I actually like meeting these strategies and activities? Do I need to like adjust these? Maybe I want to incorporate something else. Um, so this is kind of like a living, breathing thing that you're always constantly coming back to. Next slide. So the self-care wheel, we're going to get into over the next couple of slides, but I just wanted to highlight each of these categories. So there's physical self-care, um, psychological self-care, emotional self-care, spiritual, personal, and professional. Um, I also want to just note real quick before we get into the rest of the slides um, that 
while I was like doing like prepare, prep, preparation for this, um, I found some additional helpful things that I'll post in the chat um, in case anyone's interested. Um, they also come from the University of Buffalo School of Social Work. So they, they have a self-care starter kit for with like helpful readings and like some ideas of self-care stuff in case anyone um, is like seeking new ideas. Um, I, there's also a really great book um, that I personally love and it's called the A to Z self-care handbook for social workers and other helping professionals um, and it's got like each chapter has like a different self-care strategy and technique with different ideas that may you may be able to incorporate into your toolkit um, so I'll post that into the chat because I know for me I saw the, the this chat comment about adulting I definitely feel that um, kind of like how do we do this like self-care thing and also like focus on all the other stuff we're doing um, and so like these I think these resources definitely can help with that um, so next slide. And uh, I'm not seeing any bullets. Okay, thank you. Um, so some physical self-care, what this looks like. So this could be eating a balanced diet, um, finding an exercise that you joy, enjoy, um, getting enough sleep, um, getting regular medical care, learning to recognize your body's warning signs, um, and taking time for intimacy as well as pampering yourself. Next slide. Yeah. Um, so before we go on to the next slide, I'm going to talk about um, um, psychological self-care, but I want to point out some folks have put in the chat some of the things they do for physical self self-care. Um, so I love the answer of going to the gym and having a beer. I love that answer because it's both self-care and self-soothing, but that is definitely physical self-care. And um, we had someone else talk about going outside and kind of walking outside and being in nature. Um, so those are all like very good physical self-care things. So if you have anything else you do for physical self-care, please, um, drop that in the chat as we go along to talk about psychological self-care. So drop in the chat also anything that you do for psychological um, self-care. Some of the ones we came up with were finding creative outlets. And so we had someone talk about painting. Um, and I think that when we think about physical or uh, creative outlets, we think about art a lot, which is great. But I also think it doesn't have to be a sophisticated art. It could be scrapbooking. It could be um, friendship bracelet making. Anyone that knows anyone that's a, a fan of Taylor Swift, they've probably gotten into friendship break bracelet making in the last couple of years. Um, so they can be um, just anything that you feel creative and um, can really kind of take your mind off of that. One of the things I think is great with a creative outlet is it usually has a rhythm to it that that brings your mind into kind of a focus. So it can help break those cycles that we talked about with vicarious trauma um, and help break that and bring your mind into a different place. Um, participating in therapy, practicing mindfulness and positive thinking. Um, I've heard people talk about gratitude practices, and that comes up in one of our other sections of our wheel as well. And taking time for yourself, really, um, looking at that for kind of some psychological, um, self-care. So Alyssa has the next one to talk a little bit about emotional self-care, and these kind of go together. So emotional self-care self -care includes um, spending time with friends, family, or pets. Um, and over on the slide over here, you can see our cats. Um, my cat is the gray one. Um, and one of my favorite self-care things is just playing with him. He sleeps while I'm working. Um, but as soon as I'm on like a lunch break or like before the work, the work day starts or after the work day, like he's always waiting right outside of my door. Um, and if not, then I'll wake him up from his nap and we'll play. Um, so it's it's like one of my favorite things to do. Um, and then this other cat is Steph. So I don't know if Steph, you want to add anything? Yeah, this is my cat Cinco. Um, so I love this picture. Um, I actually left it in. I We did this presentation in June. And so I gave this, uh, put this presentation or put this picture of him with his little rainbow, rainbow face. Um, but I love putting stuff in about our cats because this is a great form of emotional self-care. I also personally, as a cat owner, think cats are the best example of self-care they take care of themselves. They are not afraid to ask for what they want. They are not afraid to tell you when they don't want you to hang out. Um, so Cinco is a very poofy old cat that I like spending time with. And he's always teaching me something about self-care. I love that. Um, so emotional self-care is also finding a hobby uh, that makes you happy, recognizing your hard work. I think that's a really important one is like celebrating those like accomplishments of things that you're doing um, self-care wise. 
Um, and then also like watching a funny movie um, and releasing your emotions. So like laughing, crying um, and other things like that. Next slide. Yeah, before we go on to the next one, I want to talk about too some of the good examples. Um, a lot of people put in here about watching movies, watching funny movies, um, specifically Willy Wonka and Legally Blonde. So I'm guessing Pamela is excited about the new Willy Wonka movie coming out um, and getting excited for those things. Um, I also want to put in here, I also want to lift up, somebody wrote, and I'm not going to be able to find it, but they wrote Cooking with Friends. And I love that one because you've got the emotional self-care of spending time with friends, but you may also have the physical self-care of nourishing yourself with healthy food that you've made yourself, or this time of year, people that have gardens that they've grown themselves. Now, I don't want to assume that this person is making healthy food, but um that that has you know there's lots of these things that overlap in in the in the um self-care wheel so those are some great examples so you can continue to lift those up and in fact i can confirm pamela is excited about the new willie welcome movie so um oh someone's like no they're they're making baked brie um which is great too i mean big brie that is just like the definition of self-soothing so i love it um, so this is one of the ones that often we get when we talk about spiritual self-care, this is one of the ones that either gets lumped in with other things or that we kind of skip over. And I think this is really important to talk about because we're not talking about religion here. We're talking about nourishing your spirit in a way um, that is going to sustain your self-care. So someone put in the chat a while ago about being in nature. And this is a great way to um, kind of bring some spiritual self-care. Um, and they really been really talked here too about watching a river flow, watching the bees buzz um, and bumble, listening to birds chirp and actually stopping to like smell the flowers. Um, so I, that expression has lasted for as long as it has because there's some truth to it. There's lots of truth to it. So I think that enjoying nature and, you know, all of that, it doesn't mean you have to go for a 16 mile hike up a mountain. It can just be walking around in your neighborhood. It can be, you know, enjoying the outside in your back door, on your backyard. Um, but that can be part of spiritual um, self-care. Finding a spiritual community. So that may be a, a community that's uh, connected with a religion. That may be something else. Meditating, practicing self-reflection or volunteering for a cause that is outside of our realm of sexual assault prevention and response or power and control. So volunteering for a cause that may involve animals or it may involve practicing your art in a way that helps volunteer for a cause. It may involve working um, on projects related to raising funds for, you know, an illness or something that's that's close to your heart. So all of those can be part of this spiritual self-care. So when you're thinking about spiritual self-care, there are many things beyond what we might think of as a organized religion. And though that may be part of your self, your spiritual self-care, great. But if it's not, this isn't necessarily something to skip over. And you'll see how some of these bullet points also interact with some of the other ones on the self-care wheel. So back to Alyssa to talk about personal self-care. Thank you. So personal self-care also includes things like creating a budget, that financial self-care, um, developing a new skill, um, getting organized, um, and also making time for building relationships. So this could be relationships in your personal life, um, like new friendships or volunteer groups um, or romantic relationships, perhaps. Um, and also setting short and long-term goals, kind of going back to that um, idea of celebrating those like accomplishments or wins with like self-care or with other things that you've got going on. Excellent. So our last category in the wheel and um, is professional self-care. And I really want, we, when I organized this originally, and then when Alyssa and I talked about this, this is one that I really want to um, present on because I am a supervisor at MCASA and I've supervised staff for a long time. And so I think it's important to focus on your professional self-care and what that means for you and how to communicate your needs in your work environment, because that's where we really start to those, because some of these things can really start to combat burnout and vicarious tra trauma. So sometimes chats with your coworker, 
um, I had a coworker that ran a half marathon over the weekend. And so immediately when I, when I see her virtually, um, cause we work from home, I want to know all about the half marathon, like tell me everything you're comfortable with. And so she told me about how she felt about it and how she did. And it was her first half marathon. So having those chats and building those relationships with your coworker at the levels that you both feel comfortable with can be really important for your professional self-care. Doing breathing exercises during your workday. Um, we gave that example at the beginning, but taking just three deep breaths, closing your eyes or relaxing your gaze or standing up and stretching, those can all be really helpful. Going for a walk during your day, planning for professional development. So sometimes you have to ask for that professional development in your workforce. Did you see a webinar that you want to attend? Did you see a conference that maybe you want to try to get funding for? Um, do you want to present at a conference? All of those things can um, help with your professional self-care. Setting reachable goals at work, um, stretching at your desk. This last one, these last two are the ones as a supervisor I could not stress enough. Um, taking your sick and vacation days. You have earned those days. They are not bonus. If you are sick, take the time to rest. If you have earned vacation days, take that time to do what you want. The only cure for burnout that I have found in all of the research, research I have done when I was a supervisor is time away, time off. And you don't want to get to the point where you're so burnt out that you can't do the job anymore and you have to take months or weeks or years away from the work. So take that time that you have earned. And if you are able to, I always encourage people to schedule and take their lunch break, even if it's 20 minutes of just you stepping away. At MCASA, when we talk about policies that help our employees, we have a paid lunch break in the middle of our day that we encourage folks to take. They have a time frame they can put it in. They can do whatever they want. They can watch TV. They can eat lunch. They can go for a walk. They can, you know, play with their um, their pets, take them outside. Um, so we encourage folks to do that. So think about how you can organize your day to help combat some of that vicarious trauma or some of that self-care or to incorporate some of that self-care. So I do have a little bit of a cautionary tale as we um, end our time together. Um, so I do want to caution against, this goes back to that self-care or that self-soothing behavior. So when you're talking about self-care, you do want to be cautious of things like excessive caffeine intake, um, excessive intake of alcohol, overindulgence in unhealthy food, use of illegal drugs, or excuse for bad behavior. So using your burnout or using your profession to excuse bad behavior in your professional and personal life. These are all real indications that this your self-care may need an adjustment. It may need some examination. It may need um it may need you to look at where you are out of balance and how to bring your self-care back into balance. Um, I know I use the word balance a lot when I talk about self-care, but I also think that that's a way for that. That's a really good description. Self-care is about balance. You're not going to be a number one doing your physical self-care every single day, but is that in balance with the other things that are going on in your life along with emotional or spiritual or professional self-care? So for our last slide, Alyssa is going to talk a little bit about the self-care wheel. So um, first, I want to just say that everyone will get a copy of this self-care wheel. I'll be sending it out in the email tomorrow morning. So that way you can like look at it. You can um, add stuff onto it for your own if you want. Um, but as we conclude, um, just be thinking about like, what are you already doing self-care wise? Um, and like, what could you do in the next seven days or the next two weeks to improve? Like thinking about incorporating some of the stuff um, that we talked about. So. Excellent. Um, so when we used to do this presentation and sometimes when we still do this presentation on purpose, we actually bring those self-care wheels to that program um, and have people fill them out there. And it's we've gotten a lot of good feedback on folks that have taken a little bit of time to do that. Um, so we encourage you to use that tool as it works for you. If you work with a team of people at your organization, you can always bring this wheel and have a conversation about where you're excelling at in self-care, where are you really taking care of yourself, and where are some ways that you could think about um, improving self-care. Um, so this concludes our presentation, and it concludes our sexual assault victim advocate training. So thank you all so, so much. 
for your time with us and for sharing these last nine live webinars for us. Um, I will I will emphasize that the website that Alyssa has been handing out does have additional self-paced trainings. We do consider that part of this um, sexual assault victim advocate training. It's some very foundational information on um, child sexual abuse and some other areas, the Sexual Assault Legal Institute that are really helpful for advocates that are new to the work. So don't forget about those. And just wishing you lots and lots of luck in your work as advocates and know that MCASA is always here with new trainings and um, expert advice as you need it. Um, so with that, I will end and turn it back over to, to Alyssa to close this out. Thank you, Steph. Um, yes, so I will be updating that website um, later today and you will have access um, tomorrow in my email. I'll be sending that link again for the training webpage um, as well as the recording for today and PowerPoint slides. Um, and the information that we dropped into the chat. Um, I also want to direct everyone's attention to the chat where I dropped the evaluation form. Um, please remember that if you want a certificate of attendance or CEU credits, you'll have to fill out that evaluation form. So thank you again for joining us and for uh, finishing off the webinar series with us. Thank you.